Let's all gather our thoughts. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. How's everybody doing? Good. Glory be to God. I know it's a little late. Um, we started a little late today, so please bear with me. I know a lot of people are tired, see bags under a lot of people's eyes, red eyes. I understand. I understand. So uh, bear with me today. Bear with me today because today is a big day. Today we have a lot to cover, a lot to cover. Uh, what week is it? It's the sixth week, so that means this, we have about three weeks left, not including this one. And we have a lot to cover. We haven't even started to talk about David's rule as a king, okay? We're still in this period of David and Saul together. And this is on purpose. I know this is a life of King David. That's the topic of the series. But you just can't talk about David without talking about Saul. As Christians in this world, we have two paths, two choices for us. Either you become like Saul or you become like David. That's it. There's no in-between there. Those are the only two choices, right? Because Saul and David both grew up in the Judaic tradition, both believed in God, both followed God to a certain point, but one of them became corrupted by the world. But one of them, the other one, David, he defeated the world. As Christians, as we're in this world, it's you, like the way, let me talk about this real quick. With death, right? Death is a concept that we struggle to content, like understand. Anytime somebody dies or something happens, we just, we try to make it make sense because it, it's one of those things that hurt. And in our minds, we want to justify it. Why does it happen? We can't really say why it happens, right? That's all in God's eyes and that's all in God's judgment. But we can say is that God does not like take the life away from someone before they've had the chance to repent, before they had the chance to be transformed. He gives everybody that chance, right? So once you're like, right, not righteous enough, but once you've fulfilled your mission that God has put you on this earth for, he'll take you away. Why? Because if you live long enough on this earth, you'll be corrupted. This is the earth we live in. So God, to protect you from corruption, once you've achieved a certain level of righteousness, once you've achieved his purpose for you, he'll take you away. Or if you have become so wicked, where you've continually grieved the Holy Spirit, where you continually ignore the voice of God, and now you are corrupting others, God will take you away. He can't have you corrupting other people. He will work and work and work. That's what we're seeing in Saul's life. Right? He's working on Saul. He's working on Saul. But it's not, it's not clicking. Right? So we have to talk about David and Saul because that's the two outcomes for us. There is no like, okay, like I'm Saul Monday through Saturday and then I'm David on Sunday. It, it doesn't work like that. You're either like David or you're either like Saul. So we have to continue to talk both of them together. So last week we left off uh, with David as a refugee. How did we get to that point? Just in case you weren't there, I'll give a quick summary. So David, after he beat Goliath, he was faced by the most hardships he's ever experienced in his life. Usually, how we think is, if we do good things, God will bless us. If we do good things, God will bless us. If we go to church, if we complete these fasts, if we wake up early, all these things, God will bless us. God will bless us. That's the mindset we kind of go in through things. David, really think about what he did. He stood up against Goliath when nobody else would. He trusted in God when nobody else did. Our logic would say, oh, he's about to receive amazing blessings. But in fact, he received crazy hardships, hardships that none of us could stand. Now, that's not to say God didn't bless him. He blessed him inwardly. Because we talked about this last week. These hardships that he's going through are preparing him to become the king that we know him to be. The king that even, like Muslims, they'll talk about David. Atheists, they know about David. Everybody knows the name of David. Why? It's in the midst of these hardships. So when we're, when we're going through these hardships, in our eyes, we don't understand it. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't add up for us. In David's life, when he was going through these hardships, it didn't make sense to him at all. That's why when you read the Psalms, he's like, God, why? Why is this happening? 
Why have you forgotten about me? Do you not hear me? But then he would always continue and end the song by saying, but I would trust in you. And look at the fruits of him trusting in God. And I said this last week, if David was able to like look back at his life and see the fruits that he bear, but like bore, like with all the people reciting the Psalms, with all the people relying on him in times of hardships, he would have done it again. He would have done those hardships again. So for us in hardship right now, let's not be narrow-minded about it. Let's not just think, oh, wow, there's no way out for me. This is too much. What is God's purpose? Because he's doing amazing things. Remember, when you're going through hardship, God gives you a hardship he knows you can handle. He believes you can handle. And he gives you the what? The tools to get through it. God is not a God who's like, here, take this hardship. I'm going to stand back and like, watch you struggle. He's going to give you a hardship that he believes you can overcome. He's like, I know your depths. I know your insides. You can overcome this. And I've given you tools to do it. And so that's what he's doing with David. That's what he does with us when, he's, when we're in hardship. So David, after he beat Goliath, a couple of things happened. Saul, he was very jealous of this because everybody was singing for David. Everybody was praising David. And in Saul's mind, he's like, is this the person that was prophesied that's going to overthrow me? And he's like, I can't let this happen. I can't let this happen. And so he comes up with several plans to get him killed. His first plan is to have him in the front line of the war against the Philistines. He calls David over. He's like, I want you to invade the Philistines and go to war with them. And David's like, okay, how many troops can I get? 10,000, 20,000? He's like, no, you only get 100 troops. His purpose is to try to get him killed. And then he's like, not only do you get 100 troops, I want you to bring me their foreskins too. I'm not going to go into detail. We talked about it last week. He's like, I want you to do that. Because he's thinking this is unrealistic. He doesn't understand that God is with David. And so he's like, surely he'll be killed by this. David, he goes to war. He brings back 200 foreskins. And Saul is shocked. After this, he comes up with a plan. Because David beat Goliath, he was rewarded with Saul's daughter. It was supposed to be his first daughter. But just to be petty, he gave his second daughter. And now his plan was, when they're sleeping together, I'll have her set him up so some assassins can come and kill him. Right? So they're coordinating this with the wife, with, the, with his daughter. But again, if you're a man of God, everybody, they, they, like, they gravitate to you because you show them love that the world has never showed him before. So she ends up falling in love with him. And so on the day that he's supposed to get killed by Saul's assassins, she tells him, they're going to come on this day, at this hour, you just leave through the window. I will make like a fake uh, little figure and I'll put it under the bed so you can escape. And so David, he escaped. Not only that, when he was playing uh, the harp for uh, Saul, Saul tried to kill him there. Saul was like, okay, now he's right next to me. I can kill him. He throws his spear. He misses. And at this point, it's where it says Saul was terrified. Because he's like, this doesn't make sense. Anybody else would have died. It's starting to click in his head that God is clearly with David. But he's continuing to like reject it. But at this point, David, he realizes he can't live there anymore. He tells Jonathan, his best friend, I'm walking in the midst of death. He's scared. He's a human. Yes, he trusted in God, but he's a human being. That's the beautiful thing about the story of David. It's like, it's not something we can't see ourselves in. He's terrified. So he decides to leave and he goes to the Philistines' country. And this is a big mistake. You don't do that. If you're a Jew, you don't go to the nation of unbelievers. It's considered unclean. But David, again, he's a human being. He's like, what, what do you want me to do, God? I'm going to die here. So he goes there. Not only does he go there, he acts crazy to be like, so they could show mercy upon him. Because they would believe, like, if somebody was, like, mentally ill or act crazy, they believed they had an evil spirit. And because they didn't want to scare the evil spirit, they would, like, be more likely to be hospitable. So he goes into the city of the Philistines drooling, like, pulling his hair, like, doing all this, things, just acting crazy. And they're like, it's not going to work. Like, you got to leave. You're not going to stay here. You're not going to stay here. They were merciful, actually. They could have killed him, but he left. So David, let's look at the things he's lost, Right? He, was, he lost his best friend. That was the tool God gave him to get past his hardships. He lost Jonathan. They were separated. He lost his wife. That's what he lost. 
He lost his job, if you will, right? He played the harp for Saul. That was his occupation. He lost his country. He became a refugee. And above all, he lost his dignity. He's the king, the anointed king by God. And he's out here in the Philistines begging for a place. These are all things that we would not be able to stand. We couldn't last through one of these. He lost all of this. This is the thing. God was more real to David than Saul was. Let me repeat that. God was more real to David than what Saul was. Yes, Saul is like this visible threat to him. But the God behind him, he knew he was going to be his fortress. He knew he was going to be his protector. That was more real to him. For us, when we're in hardships, when we're struggling, our issue is bigger than God. That's why we're always anxious, because our anxiety is bigger than God. That's why we're always stressed, because our stress is bigger than God. That's why we're always worried, because our worry is bigger than God. That's what we're saying. That's how we're moving. That's how we're thinking. But David was none of these things, because he knew his God was bigger. He knew his God was bigger than his Saul. Nobody who has ever trusted in God has ever been let down. I think we said this week one, but it's worth repeating. Nobody who's ever trusted in God has ever been let down. I don't know how many billion of people have lived on earth since its conception. Maybe trillion, I don't know. But not a single person who's ever trusted in God has ever been let down. It's never happened. That's a very comfortable thing, like something that you could take comfort in. Moses, for example, he got put in the wilderness. He trusted in God, right? Like, think about it. Like, first, what did he do before? Before the wilderness, what happened? He freed the Israelites. He freed the Israelites. Again, you would think, okay, great blessing. He, something big is about to happen. He did something amazing. He stood up to Pharaoh. He split the Red Sea. It's about to be a big blessing. What happened? In the wilderness. People complaining. Everybody hungry. Everybody thirsty. Not only that, he's in the wilderness to like lead him to the promised land. He didn't even get to see the promised land. After all of that work, he didn't get to see it. He didn't get to touch it. He didn't get to enter into it. But he still trusted in God. And what happened because he trusted in God? During Christ's uh, transfiguration, who was right next to him? Moses. So that promised land he didn't get to see in his life, in his afterlife, he saw it next to God himself. Nobody who's ever trusted in God has ever been let down. Joseph, he always trusted in God. What did his trust get him initially? It got him sold into slavery. But he kept trusting in God. His trust never wavered. Then what happened? Second in charge of Egypt. Find me somebody who's trusted in God who's been let down. It doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. So David, he's trying to go to the nation of the Philistines. They're not letting him in. So he's like, he doesn't know where to go. He finds a cave, he goes to the cave, and he makes the cave home. This is where he writes a lot of his famous psalms. Like those psalms that we read in hardship, there are certain psalms, especially if you read the psalms, you can tell some are more like, uh, there's some about rejoicing, and there's some that's like sadness and despair almost. These are where the most of those are written. And he's in a cave, you got to picture this. He's crying, he's hurt, because imagine, it's one thing if you do something wrong and then bad things happen. You can understand that. If you do something wrong, if you sin, if you commit evil and bad things happen, it's like, it makes sense. But if you do everything right and you follow God all your life and bad things happen, that's another type of pain. It's very hurtful. I mean, forget it about, about God for a second. Like in our lives, right, where we, we, we do everything right in school, but we still fail that exam. Where we're doing everything at work, but we get passed on for the promotion. Somebody else gets it. Where you feel like you're doing everything right in your marriage, but the other person is not receiving it. It's a very hard thing. And so David, he's really hurt by this. In his mind, he's like, I never asked for this. I never asked for this. And it was very tough for him. It was very tough for him. So David, he's there. He's writing his psalms. He's calling on to God. He's holding on to him. He's holding on to him. And as he's in the cave... He looks out from afar, and he sees a group of people approaching him. And he's like, that's it. It's done for me. That's Saul and his troops. I'm done. I have nowhere to go. And as they get closer, 
It's not Saul. It's his father, Jesse. And it's his siblings. It's his family. And remember what his family did, right? They forgot about him. They, his dad didn't even know he existed. He forgot he existed. When David went to serve his brothers in the war, they're like, leave, you're just looking for attention. The ones, the brothers in the family that called him the shepherd boy, that didn't even call him by the name, they're the ones coming into the cave. Why? David, he's an enemy of the state. So what does that mean? So is his family. And so they're coming to the cave seeking shelter. They're like, David, you know we were just messing with you, little bro. Like, you know, we, we didn't mean it like that. Like, you know, uh, his dad's like, uh, your name, what was your name? Uh, Dave? David? Like, you know, like, they were trying to make, they were trying to find a safe place to be. And imagine what you would do here. What would you do here? You would be like, absolutely not. Like, absolutely not. After everything you put me through, and I'm going through so much right now, I've lost my wife, I've lost my country, I lost my dignity, I lost my job, I lost my best friend, and now you're trying to take shelter with me because you know I'm going to be the next king? We would have said absolutely not. But you know what he does? He greets them, he bows down to them, he takes care of them. He's like, I don't have much here, but this rock right here is the most comfortable rock to rest on. You could take this rock. Me, I don't need the rock. I could, I'll, I'll, I'll stand. It's fine. This dirt right here, it's the warmest dirt in the whole cave. You can use it as your blanket. Me, don't worry about me. Take it. They're like, oh, we're, we're sorry. He's like, oh, sorry. For, don't be sorry. For what? Like, I know you guys were just messing with me. Like, this is the type of person he is. After that, 400 people come into the cave. As Saul is uh, leading, by the way, if you've caught on by now, he's really occupied with David. If he's really occupied by David... Something got to be neglected. He's neglecting the country. So it says 400 people who are in distress, debt, and discon discontent are walking towards the cave. So now David, a man with his own issues, his own problems, his own stress, has 400 other people approaching him. How do you think David responds? He takes care of them. He takes care of them. This is what he did. Isn't this kind of like... Similar, is this connecting a dot to someone in the New Testament? Is this not like Christ? Remember when Christ, when he would serve, when he would walk for hours and he would heal people and all these things, it says it in the scripture. Like he was exhausted, he was tired. And then he looked up and he saw a multitude of people again. And it said he was moved with compassion for them. He was tired, of course. But he saw them and was moved for compassion by them. That's the same thing that David did. Yes, he was hurt, but he saw them, and he was moved with compassion for them, just like our Lord and Savior. This is what Christ did. In this cave, David became a light to everybody else. He became a light to them. This world, we can call this world a cave, a lot of darkness, a lot of sadness. Christ came and became a light for this cave we call the world, just like David did. And the most beautiful thing about this is David he transformed them by showing them love. These people became his army. They became his right-hand men. They became loyal to him when he became king. He transformed them. He made them into valuable assets. This is what Christ did with the disciples. He took a tax collector. He took prostitutes. He took Pharisees. And he turned them into valuable assets to spread the gospel. That's what happened. Moral of the story here, David, who's a type of Christ, transformed others. We need to allow Christ to transform us. You have to give something for God to bless. Give him something, and he will change your life. He will heal you. He will deliver you. Give him something. You know what's funny? We have this concept, especially in the West, of like, take care of yourself first. Like, like, I can't pour into someone else's cup until my cup is full. Like, I, I got my own problems. Once I deal with my problems, then I can help you with your problems. And we say this in the Christian like, world, in the church. We say this to each other. Like, I, I can't help that person right now. I have my own burden. Like, let me, like, fill my cup first, and then I can help the other person. Do you think David's cup was filled? Do you guys think David's cup was filled? You guys are saying no? It absolutely was filled. We're saying no because we're looking at externally, outside. Inside, he was at peace. 
Inside he had God. Inside he had Christ. That's the only way he could take care of these people. If he wasn't at peace with God, if he wasn't having his cup full, there's no way he could take care of anybody else. That's the only reason why we say, I have to focus on myself first. Because we are not letting Christ inside fully. Because just no matter what you're going through, when you let Christ in your heart, he will give you the strength to feel compassion for others no matter what you're going through. To be there for others. To care for others. David's cup was absolutely full. If you look at it internally, that's why he's a man after God's heart. So there's a story. It could be true. It could be false. I'm not sure. Uh, there's this guy who's having a terrible week. He's having an awful week, a terrible week. Everything is going bad for him, right? It's one of these weeks where, like, the light is broken when he's in traffic. Like, everybody's stuck. He's late for work. His boss is upset with him. And, like, all these kind of things. And even aside from that, his personal life is terrible, right? He's having relationship issues. His mother is not in the best health. All of these things are going on. And on top of that, he's the oldest sibling. If you guys are older siblings, you understand. I feel for you guys. And so he's going through this. He's very stressed, very, uh, like, like, annoyed and all these things and he's like you know what I just need like some time to myself and so he decides to pray and he prays and he asks God he's like God like help me out here like what did I do to deserve this like oh this is too much of a burden help me out here and he waits he looks at his watch and nothing happens he's like I tried whatever and he leaves his prayer corner he leaves his prayer room he gets a call from one of his friends his friend calls he sees it he ignores it. I'm going through too much right now. I don't got time for this. I'm going through too much right now. I don't got time for this. Another friend calls, different person. He looks at it. He ignores it. I'm going through too much right now. I don't have time. I can't. I have my own burdens. I don't want to hear what they have to say. I don't, I, I'm good. And then his friends come, about three, four, five of them. They actually come to his house. They knock on his door. They're like, what's up? Like, you, we haven't seen you in a while. Is everything okay? He's like, I'm fine. I just need to be alone. I need to take care of myself first. I appreciate you guys for coming. I'm good. And then he sends them away. He goes back to his prayer corner, and he calls on God's name. He's like, God, I'm, like, up to here with it. Like, I, I, I'm about to break. Why are you just ignoring my prayers? And God answers him, and he says, what are you talking about? I sent three, four, five people to you to assist you while you're in distress. You see, God, he heals communally, not individually. God heals communally, not individually. We are his hands. We are his eyes of this earth. We are, that's why he calls us the light of the earth, the salt of the earth, so we can help each other out. He uses us and puts us in each other's life to deliver us, to help us. We are his tools. We are his tools. He uses all of us. When you're only concerned about yourself, when you're only concerned about what you're going through, it's really hard to see what God is sending into your life. Psalm 34. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Can we say this with me? I sought the Lord and he answered me. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is David writing. This is David writing in the midst of hardship. He still has Saul persecuting him. He's still a refugee. He still lost his best friend. What is he talking about? What was he delivered from? Like, he still has these issues. He was delivered from his inside doubt. That's what he was delivered from. Us, we don't have this kind of vision. We don't have this kind of spirituality. We don't. David, he's like, you delivered me, God, in the middle of a cave. When he could die any second, thank you, God, you delivered me. This is David. As Christians, we don't pray to not have hardships. We don't do that. We pray to be blessed through the hardships. In this life, if you're praying to God and you're begging God, God, like, please give me joy, give me happiness, give me pleasure, all these things. Take away the sadness, take away the anxiety, take away It's not how it works. God wants you to be complete. He wants you to lack nothing. How can you be complete 
if there's no hardships in your life, if everything is comfortable. You see what the issue is with comfortability? Your flesh loves comfortability. And what does the scripture tell us? Our flesh and our soul are constantly in opposition. So if you're comfortable, your flesh is happy. If your flesh is happy, you're practicing sin. God doesn't want that for you. He wants more for you. That's why he sends hardships. That's why James tells us these hardships are here to complete you. That's why James tells us when these hardships come, consider it pure joy. That's why the Bible tells us this. When the three kids were thrown in the fire, when they were thrown in the fire, they didn't pray for the fire to be gone. They prayed that God be in the midst with the, in the fire. You see? We have to do the same. We don't pray for our hardships to go away. I know it's hard. But we pray for God to be in that hardship with us. Because guess what? He is. He is. John Chrysostom says this. Beautiful quote. Suffering is our teacher. Suffering is our teacher. We do not bring it on ourselves but we courageously bear it. Can we put the slide up for this? But we courageously bear it. If we have to face it as it is a source of much goodness, do not covet a life that is free of afflictions. That is not for your own good. He calls suffering a teacher. This is how you learn to become like Christ. Who is the prince of suffering? Who is the king of suffering? Our Lord and our Savior himself. So he's saying suffering is the greatest teacher. He's like, we don't bring it on ourselves. Nobody willingly wants to suffer. But he says, we courageously bear it if we have to face it because it's a source of much goodness. And then he finally says, do not covet a life that is free of afflictions. My brothers and sisters, do not look for a life that is stress-free, that is free of worry. All of this does is it breeds comfortability. And with comfortability comes sin. So last week, David made a big mistake, the biggest mistake in his life so far. Who remembers? I'm going to call on someone randomly. I'm just joking. <laughs> Somebody actually raised their hand. What is David's greatest mistake, where he made at this point? Does anybody remember? Huh? He lied. David, as a refugee, again, he's a human being. The Bible doesn't tell us all the best things about anybody. We know the Bible is true because it highlights their mistake. David, he's a refugee. He goes to a priest's house, a priest's house, and he lies to the priest's face and says, Saul told me to come here by myself, and he told me to tell you to give me food and give me weapons. Saul never said this. He lied to the priest. In a moment of stress, in a moment of despair, he lied to the priest. He made a big mistake. In the meantime, Saul, he hears about this. He hears that David was at this priest's house. So Saul, he brings his troops. They go to the priest's house. And he goes to the priest. He's like, I heard David was here. And the priest is like, yeah, he was. I heard you gave him food and weapons. And he's like, yeah, I did. Like, of course. Like, and he's like, why would you do that? It's like, because David's amazing. Like, David's a great person. David, like, who's like him in all of Israel? And Saul is boiling when he hears this. He says this, All of you have conspired against me, and there's no one who reveals to me that my son has made a covenant with the son of Jesse, that's David. And there's not one of you who is sorry for me or reveals to me that my son has stirred up my servant against me to lie and wait as it is in this day. Basically, Saul's saying, it's all your guys' fault. It's your guys' fault. I'm in distress. All of you guys are against me. Everybody has become an enemy to him. Sometimes we, we all know somebody like this, right? Maybe it's us where everybody else is the problem and not them. Again, if you take anything away from this series is ask God for the ability to look inwards at all times. Saul, he, this is the source of his problems. He's unable to blame himself. Everybody else is wrong. He's complaining here. It's all, it's your fault. It's your fault. All you guys are against me. I'm doing nothing wrong. You guys just hate me. David's trying to kill me. All of this is made up. You know, in fact, uh, like a lot of like scholars, they say like because of this stress, Saul has schizophrenia. Like it, 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 that, he, he gained a mental illness because of all of this paranoia, all of this anxiousness, all of this stress. And so he starts losing it. Like I said, he's convinced David is trying to kill him. 
And you know what he says? He tells his troops, kill the priests right now. Kill all of them. There's about 85 priests there. Kill them. And the, the troops, they look at him, they're like, these are priests. Uh, they all just stand there. They're like, no, like we can't do it. And then there's somebody else who's there. His name is spelled D-O-E-G. I'm going to call him Doug. Okay? It's, it's probably like Doeg, but I'm going to call him Doug. And Doug, he's a Gentile. He's a Gentile. So he doesn't care if you're a priest, if you're a Jew or anything. He's not, he's, he's just like Saul's like servant. Probably from when he captured some slaves from uh, the countries he conquered. He's one of those. And Doug's like, I'll kill him. I'll kill all of them, like, no problem. And he, he has like three brain cells. Like, I don't think he's very the smartest person. So he's like, I'll kill them. I'll kill them. And so he takes the sword and he kills 85 priests that day on Saul's command. Whose fault is this? It's David's fault. Because of David, 85 priests were killed. This is one blemish on the life of David. He did this. He lied. And then after this, David start, uh, Saul's telling like, his tribe now. What tribe is he from? Do you guys remember? Benjamin. So this is the smallest tribe. Now Saul, he's very paranoid. And so he gathers all the Benjamites. He's like, you guys, if you guys defend me, if you guys kill David, I'll make sure you guys have power. I'll make sure you guys are kings and princes and rulers. He's the king of Israel, but he turns to his ethnicity. He turns to his tribe. He's having a hard time leading. He's having a hard time trusting. Compare this to someone like Moses. Moses, when he was about to die, he picked the next leader. The next leader was Joshua. Moses had children. He didn't pick any of his sons. He picked Joshua because he's a man after God, and he knows that this is the best person for the job. Saul turns to his own ethnic group. Everything is spiraling down for him. Everything is not working. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, it says this, There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one Christ in Jesus. We know this verse, but very few of us live by it. When push comes to shove, we align with those who think like us, with people who may be of the same ethnicity as us, people who may be of the same skin color as us. We do these things. We show preferential treatment. Whether you know it or not, subconsciously, a lot of us, we show preferential treatment. And a lot of us, like, forget the preferential treatment. We're bold about it. We stand for, like, one person, and we deny the other person. And that's what Saul is doing here. But all are one in Christ Jesus. When man loses his relationship with God, the source of peace, he sees all people around him as enemies. He flees in seven rows with nobody after him. It is his inner thoughts that chase him and scatter his energies. While he who enjoys peace with God would harbor peace in his heart and peace with his fellow men and would not fear even his opponents. When you lose your relationship with God, the devil becomes your biggest accuser. It doesn't get easier when you stray away from God. The devil starts accusing you. Let's look at Judas. Judas. You guys think Judas decided to just betray Christ randomly? Like he woke up one morning, he's like, today's a great day to betray Christ? Like, no. That's not what happened. He would steal from the money box for years. The money box that the apostles gathered for years. I can imagine the first time he stole, he felt guilty. He was like, ah, oh, I feel so bad. I shouldn't do it. And then he did it again. He's like, ah, oh, I need to stop. Like, should I confess? And then he did it and did it. He's like, wow, I'm not getting caught. And he kept doing it, he kept doing it, he kept doing it, and he became numb to it to the point he sold his Lord and Savior. And then the devil started accusing him. The devil was like, wow, you betrayed the one who, like, believed in you? You betrayed the one who trusted you? How dare you? And so he brings the coins that he sold Christ for, and he throws it at the Jews. He's like, take it, free him. He's like, no, we're not going to free him. And then what does he do? The devil keeps accusing him, he keeps accusing him, he keeps accusing him. And then ultimately, he kills himself. That's the devil's goal, for you to perish. He gets you to sin, and then he accuses you. He tells you lies. He gets you to believe it. And then he gets you to destroy yourself. That's how he works. So one person escapes this massacre. One of the priests escape, and it's the son of the head priest. And he goes to David. He runs to David, and he's like, look what you've done. You, because of you, 
My father's dead. My uncles are dead. My family's dead. My priesthood, all, all of this is in jeopardy because of you. How dare you do this? And this is a very serious accusation. Like, David is supposed to be the next king. Like, most of us, we would lie if we were accused by, what are you talking about? Like, I, I didn't have nothing to do with that. You know what David says? I have caused the death of all the people in your father's house. Stay with me, do not fear, for he who seeks my life seeks your life, but with me you shall be safe. David owned up here, and I think that's very embarrassing. He's the next king of Israel. He's about to be the next leader. He lied to a priest. He has every incentive to just say, that was, I didn't do that. Like Saul's crazy. You believe him? But he says, you're right, I did, and I'm sorry. Stay with me, and I promise you, I will protect you, but your whole life. That's a man after God's heart. These are the beautiful things about David. Now after this, David is starting to get comfortable with his troops. They're starting to get comfortable in the cave. Like, this cave's not so bad after all. It's not too bad. We're getting comfortable here. Like you were right, the rocks are comfy. The dirt is really warm. Like this is great. And God talks to David and he tells David, I want you to go back to Judah. Who lives in Judah? Who lives there? Saul. God is telling David, go back to the place where the person who's trying to kill you is. Go back. David's like, uh, why? I'm like, for what? He's like, I need you to defend the people there. There's a war going on. I need you to defend the people. And David's like, okay. And like, he's gathering his troops and he's about to go and he's like, one second. God, are you sure? He's like, yes, go, defend the troops. And so David, he goes there, he enters Jerusalem. Saul hears about it. So word gets back to Saul, David's in town. And you know what Saul says? God has delivered him into my hand. This is the craziest verse in the Bible. This man just finished killing 85 priests. And he's like, Tamaskan, God, you sent me, you sent me David. This is, a, this is how far gone he is. You see, sometimes when we want something to be true, we will take anything as a sign. We'll take anything as a sign. We have to really test to see if things are from God. One of the saints of the church, uh, Saint Macarius, <laughs> he was told he felt a calling to go to the wilderness. He felt a calling to go to the wilderness, but he wanted to see if this calling was from God or if it was the devil's temptation. And you know how long he waited before he did it? Five years. You have to test see. You can make anything sound like it's from God. You can make everything make sense. Like, oh, like, like he made eye contact with me and then followed me. He wants me. Like, you, you, can, you, you can make anything connect. In fact, true story, true story. I'm going to expose myself here. I've done it before, so it's fine. Uh, when I was a... Uh, is my, I, I, never mind. I thought, is my fiance here? She might be here. I, anywho, I asked for her permission to say it anyway. When I was in second grade, <laughs> when I was in second grade, hey, it, it matters, it matters, you know? When I was in second grade, I actually, I had my first crush. First one ever. I did, I'm just being honest with you guys. Bear with me here, stick with me, stick with me. Every time I looked over at this person, she was always looking at me. I would look, she would look, she would look away. I'm like, interesting. Okay, that's sign number one. <laughs> that's sign number one. And then, like, I'm like a, I used to be very, like, outgoing. Like, I used to be, like, the class clown, if you will. Like, I would make jokes, whatever. And, like, we had, like, a, every Friday we would do, like, we would start the day off with, like, some, like, they would play some music and, like, everybody would dance or something. And, like, I got up, like, front and center and I started dancing. I was in second grade. Everybody did it. And, like, I was making sure she could see me. And like, she's laughing. She's laughing as I'm doing it. I'm like, yeah, she thinks I'm funny. <laughs> sign two, sign two. And then finally, one day, I'm sitting at a table, and there's four seats at the table. It's three of us at the table. She comes in late. This is the only table, that's the only seat left in the, in the classroom. She sits next to me. I'm like, that's it. It's, it's, she, she wants me. And I, I get so excited. It's my first crush. 
And I'm telling everybody, this girl, she likes me, she likes me, she likes me. At recess, I'm telling everybody, she likes me, she likes me, she likes me. And so she's come now at recess when we're playing, she's coming towards me with a group of her friends. And I'm telling all my friends, like, watch, like, she's going to tell me she likes me. And you know what she says? Why are you telling people I like you? I said, what do you mean? Like, uh, first of all, lower your voice like you. <laughs> why you? What do you mean? And she's like, why are you telling people I like you? I'm like, look, you, you keep making eye contact at me. She's like, because you're looking at me first. I'm like, okay, well, like, explain, like, why you were, like, laughing, like, at me while I was dancing. She's like, I wasn't, like, I was laughing because the person next to you was laughing. Like, we were laughing at you. I'm so serious. And I'm like, okay, why did you sit next to me? Why did you sit next to me? She's like, first, that was the only empty seat left. Second, the guy I actually like was at that table. I, at this point, I had to, I asked my mom if I could move schools. <laughs> so my point is, when you're looking for something to be true, you will find any reason to justify it. You will find any reason to be justified. You have to be very careful. Not everything's a sign from God. The devil very much will bring something, wrap it up in a gift, make it look beautiful, present it to you, and you're like, wow, thank you, God. Just because you get that job you're asking for, what does it mean it's a blessing? You test it. You, we have to be very careful with these things, like confirmation bias, right? You guys know what that is? It's like if you're constantly telling yourself something, like you will look for anything to prove it. Like horoscopes, for example. Horoscopes. These are the most general things. I'm sorry if I offended someone. This is most general. It's like something great will happen for you today. Like, okay, like what does that mean? Like, you know, it says these kind of things. In our church, do we believe in horoscopes? What is our stance on this? Do we? We don't. Why? Well, we could look at the Bible. Was, there was twins in the Bible, if you guys remember. Jacob and Esau, born on the same day, like a few minutes apart. So they should be very similar based off horoscopes. They are complete opposites. One is a man after God. The other person is a man after the world. One's a man of hunting. One's a man of prayer. So... We have to be very careful and test to see if these things are from God. And so after this, David, he talked to God, and God was like, yeah, Saul's coming to kill you now. Like, you can leave. So, like, he delivered him. And then after this, it's just a cycle of Saul chasing David. Saul would find out that David's somewhere. He'd go there. David would run away, and it would be a cycle. And as I'm reading this, I'm wondering, like, why is Saul still alive? Like, seriously, why hasn't God wiped him off? I'm, I'm so serious. Like, he's, he's going against God's plan. Remember, David is God's plan. Why is God just letting him continue to do this? Why is God letting him kill priests? Simple. He loves Saul. Even at our worst, God loves us. Even at our worst, God is still trying to work on us. Even when we become like animals, God is like, that's my son. That's my daughter. He's still working on him. God's will is not to punish you, but to have mercy on you. God's will is not to punish you, but to have mercy on you. If you're like me, you grew up thinking, if I, like, if I ignore my mom's call, something bad is going to happen to me. Like, I used to think like that. If I did something bad, but like, something is waiting for me, like lightning, something's going to happen. I used to think like that. I was very fearful. But that's not the God we have. God is looking for any excuse to forgive you. He's looking for any excuse to forgive you, and that's what he's doing with Saul. Before David leaves Judah, Jonathan hears he's there, and he runs to meet him secretly. And at this point, David, he's at a low. He was in Judah. He's like, wow, I forgot how much I missed it here. Like, it brought him to tears. Like, this is my home. These are my people. It felt so good defending them. Now I have to run away again? And that hurt him more than what the state he was in before. He's like, God, why would you give me a taste of this? But then God sent him Jonathan. Jonathan strengthened him. And Jonathan's like, don't worry. I'm with you. When you are king, just remember me. Remember, he's supposed to be the king. Jonathan is. He's the son of Saul. But he's like, no, you're going to be king. I just ask that you remember me. He had nothing to give David. He couldn't protect him from his father anymore. 
He couldn't house him. All he had was love. And that love strengthened David when he left Judah again. Okay, so now we're going to get into the, the, the drama here, the, the most, the most action-packed scene, if you will. So Saul, he hears that David is in the cave. He finds out the cave. I don't know, like, how he's getting his location, who's telling who, but he keeps finding out. And so he finds out that Saul is in the cave. So David is, and his troops are on one side of the cave. They're very few, by the way. They're like, what, 400-something. And Saul and his troops, they enter through the other side. And they're looking for David. They're looking for him. And Saul, he's actually walking alone, which is weird. Because usually if you're like a king, you never walk alone. You have troops around you at all times. And David and his troops, they see Saul walking alone. And so I was confused. So I, I Googled this. I'm like, the Bible doesn't specify like what he was doing. It said he was tending to his needs. And I Googled it. I did some research. He had to use the bathroom. I'm not joking. I, I, I'm, I'm serious. Like, I looked at the commentary. He had to use the bathroom. That's what it said. So he had to use the bathroom. That's, and it makes sense. Why else would he be alone? And so David's men, they're hiding, and they see, like, now is your chance. Kill him. God has delivered him into your hands. You will never get a chance like this again. Can't you see what God has done for you? Kill him. Kill him. Kill him. And David, he's panicking. He's like, God, do you want me to? Should I do it? Should I do it? I don't know what to do, what to do, what to do. Should, like, he's very nervous. And at the end, he's like, okay, fine, fine. And he runs towards Saul. Saul, obviously, he's, he's preoccupied, so he didn't notice. David, he goes up to him with his sword, and he's like shaking. And he just cuts off a piece of his robe and runs back. And they're like, what are you doing? Like, kill him. Like, we're here in the cave with you. We want to leave the cave. Like, you might like it, but like, get rid of him. Get rid of him. And then it says something very beautiful. David's heart troubled him because he had cut Saul's robe. I know. (laughs) David, he had every spiritual reason to kill him. It made sense. It feels like God delivered him into David's hands. And David couldn't do it. He cut off his robe and he was troubled by it. He was sensitive to, David was sensitive to anything that may separate him from God. So he's holding this robe and he's shaking. He's like, what have I just done? What have I just done? One small sin in front of God is not acceptable. And David, he was very hurt by this. How many of us would have like killed Saul? All of us would have. All of us, like (laughs) we would like sharpen the knife like with a smile on our face. We would have done it. We would have done it. But David was troubled. He was troubled by it. You know what What he said after that? How dare I lift my hand against God's anointed? Whether I like Saul or not is irrelevant. God chose him. How dare I do it? Remember, vengeance is of the Lord, not of us. I wish we treated our fathers like this, our priests like this. They are anointed by God himself. I know that we all have our experiences, all these things. We may hear these things. Oh, this priest is like a Pharisee. This priest is greedy. This priest did this. That is anointed by God. God himself chose that priest, whether you like it or not. And he's probably not as bad as Saul. Again, I'm not here to absolve anybody. I'm here to say, though, look what David did. How dare I raise my finger against the person God anointed? How dare we raise our voice, raise our gossip, say these things about God's anointed? Not because they're a good person, not because of anything, forget that, but because God himself anointed them. We're living in a very cruel generation, a sad generation where we talk about people, we go straight to Instagram, we don't care, we go to Facebook, we say all these things about priests, that's God's anointed. David trembled. Not because Saul was a good person, but because that's chosen by, he's chosen by God. That's a huge lesson for us to learn here. That's a huge lesson for us to learn. Your love for God is measured by your love for your enemies. This is what it means to be a Christian. This is what it means to be a Christian. This is what it means to follow 
Christ, to be a follower of Christ. You're just like everybody else if you repay evil for evil. You're just like everybody else if you gossip because they gossip about you. You're just like everybody else. How are you different? How are you sealed by Christ? How are you separated? It's by loving your enemy. God, he wants us to be so much more special. He's like, you guys are special. You're not like the world. You're not of the world. But we're like, oh, I'm pretty basic. I'm going to hate those who hate me. I'm going to lie to those who lie to me. I'm going to love those who love me. God's like, no, no, don't do that. Be different. Be special. We're like, no, I'm pretty much of the world. He said, no, be out of the world. Our calling is so much more different, guys, my brothers and my sisters. It's so much more different. We are hold to a higher standard. That's our mark as Christians. That's our mark as Christians. So David, as he's trembling with this, he's like, like, like freaking out. He's very scared. And so Saul and his troops are like, oh, we can't find David. Like, let's just leave. And they're leaving. And David's like, I'm going to give this back to him. And his troops are like, huh? Like, what are, you, what are you talking about? He's like, I'm going to give it back to him. He's like, no, are you crazy? He's going to kill us all. Like, we're outnumbered now. He's going to see us coming. Like, I have to give it up to him. They're like, no, no, don't go. They're trying to hold him. And he starts running to Saul. He's like, Saul, 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 Saul. And he goes down on his knees. And he's like, look, my Lord, my Father, my King, if I wanted to kill you, I could have. Why are you persecuting me? Why are you chasing after me? I don't want your throne. You are my father. You are my king. Why are you chasing after a dog? Why are you chasing after a flea? I am nothing. I'm of no threat to you. And he's in tears. He's begging Saul. He's like, why are you doing this? And Saul was like, for the first time, he used to call David the son of Jesse, but he's like, David, is that you, my son? And he starts crying too. And he says, surely you are more righteous than I, for you have rewarded me with good, whereas I have rewarded you with evil. This is a very beautiful moment. And this makes me feel for Saul. It really does. Because you see the glimpses of a man who's fighting to hold on to God. This is why his story is so sad and tragic. It's because he has these moments in his life where you see he's he's trying to hold on to God. But like I said, this world is harsh. The devil keeps accusing. And so unfortunately, Saul and David, this moment, it doesn't last much longer. Proverbs 16, verse 7. When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. When you're kind, when you're loving, you can change your enemies, even if it's for a second. Trust me, try it out. True story, actually. There was a, a guy, he, he, he works at, a, I think it was Amazon or something. This is in Seattle. It's one of my friends. Um, he goes there, and he's, he's late. He's late to work. There's a lot of traffic. And he's like, I'm only two minutes late. And his boss is usually really nice. He clocks in late, and his boss is like, what's up? He's like, hey, so yeah, sorry, I'm late. He's like, don't let that happen ever again. He's like, excuse me. Like, he's like, don't, don't let it happen again. And he's like, okay, fine. And then he's like doing his work, and then he clocks out to go to lunch. He comes back from lunch late. But again, he's like, my boss is usually understanding. And his boss is like, what are you doing? Who who gave you this long of a lunch break? Why are you being lazy? We need to be productive. And it took everything in him to not like say, first of all, like, who are you talking to? Like, this is America. You can't talk to me like this. Like, you know, he he, he was was getting very upset. But he didn't say anything. At the end of the day, when he's getting ready to leave, he makes it a point to stop by his boss's office. And he's like, I'm totally sorry for being late. I hope you have a good rest of your night. The next day, I'm not joking, his boss is there. He's like, you know what, sorry about that yesterday. I'm having some like personal issues. You know, I really do apologize. Aren't you due for a promotion? I'm, I'm so serious. But versus if he was to snap back at him, if he was to repay rudeness with rudeness, this would never would have happened. This is what happens. I'm going to wrap things up. I know this is, a, like I said, we have to really, we have only three more weeks left, so we have to condense everything together. Um, 
So David, he gives this back to Saul, and they go their separate ways again. David, he doesn't want to go back to Judah. He doesn't trust Saul. He's wise as a serpent. What does the gospel tell us? Be wise as a serpent. He's being wise. He's like, look, Saul is unstable. I can't go back to Judah. So he stays there. Is this fair to David, though? Saul, he's going to a palace, and David is going back to the cave. It's a very, like, it brings that question. Is it fair? Well, if we look at this next slide, it'll tell us. If man acquires all goodness, but has hatred in his heart towards his brother, he is a foreigner to God. You can ask, is it fair, is it unfair? But Saul has become a foreigner to God. And David is building up his room in the kingdom of heaven. God is building it up for him. He's preparing his room. So, David lost his family, his home, his best friend, his wife, all these kind of things. In life, you're going to lose a lot of things. In life, a lot of things will happen. How you look at it, though, is going to determine your joy in this world. If you look at it negatively, that's how the world is going to be, very negative. If you look at it positively, life becomes sweeter, becomes bearable. David, rather than saying, I lost my wife, I, like, or how could this happen? He said, thank you, God, for giving me a wife. She saved my life. Rather than saying, I almost got murdered, like, I, like I, I'm anxious and I'm very worried about it. He's like, thank you, God, you delivered me from those attacking me. Rather than saying, God, I lost my home, he said, thank you, God, you made the cave a home. That's everything in this world. If you're able to attain that mindset, life is sweet. You see, Saul, he was miserable. David, outwardly, on the outward, he was miserable. I mean, he would prefer to be in Judah. What is the difference? God is trying to work on both of them. We're seeing this. God is working in David's life. God is working in Saul's life. The difference is one of them allowed God to work in their life while the other was resisting. That's the issue. I'm going to wrap up with this verse, and then I'll say a story, and we'll call it, we'll, we'll be done. Romans chapter 12, verse 17, verse 21. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap a burning coal to his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. What did I say in the beginning? Nobody who's ever trusted in God will ever be let down. David, we're going to see next week. Saul, don't worry, God will not be mocked. God is going to deal with Saul. And David understood that. He's like, that's not my job to kill him. It's not my job. Just like it's not our job to talk negatively about others, about priests or whatever. God, like I said, he will not be mocked. Don't worry. He will deal with it accordingly in his own way. He does not need you to be the, the, the person of justice and the person to go on Instagram and, you know, go on live and say that. He doesn't need you to do that. Now, it's one thing if somebody is saying heresy, or they're saying false teachings. That's not what I'm talking about. But God, revenge is for him. He will deal with it. I love this last part. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. You know how, like, I, I've been in that position before where I was rude and somebody was amazingly nice to me. I felt like the worst person ever. I literally felt like my head was burning. Like, it, like I felt the coals. I really did. It was, it's, it's a very, like, if you've ever been in that position, it's very true. It's very true. Anywho, David and Saul, they have this moment of, like, forgiveness. David is asking for forgiveness out of humility. He has no reason to do it. He didn't do anything. And then Saul asked for forgiveness. We have this moment of forgiveness. There's a story. could be true. could be false. I don't know. This is the last thing. There's a person. He lives his life in this world. His life comes to an end, and he wakes up, and he sees, like, it seems to be like paradise, right? Everything's bright. He sees like gates, he sees like rainbows, like it, it seems peaceful, he's like, wow, like is this, is this heaven, did I make it? Like he's very like pleased by it, it looks amazing. 
he sees everybody like, he sees like a large line though. There's a line. And people are like entering through the gates, like one by one through the line. And he's very confused. He's like, what's going on here? Like, why is there a line? And like, everybody's like showing like some kind of identification and they're getting it. He's like, I didn't know the ID here. Like, what's going on? Like, he's very confused. And then when it's up to his turn to go in, he like reaches in his pocket and he has like different cards, different identi- like identification cards. And he has one card that talks about how much he went to church. He's like, here's this card. And they're like, sorry, we don't take that. Then he has another card of how much he confessed. They're like, no, we don't, we don't take that either. Then he has a card of how much he served. Like, this is all the service I've done in my life. Like, we don't take that. And then somebody else passed him, gave him a card, and they let him in. He's like, what's this card? What, what is it? He's like, this is the card of forgiveness. This is the card of forgiveness. St. Macarius says this, forgiveness is the mark of Christians. Those who forgive have been forgiven by God. Those who do not forgive have not been forgiven by God. That is our identity as Christians. How we treat our enemies, how we forgive our enemies, how we forgive that person that broke our heart, how we forgive that person that dragged our name, how we forgive that person that abandoned us, that is the measurement of how Christ looks at us. That is the measurement on how Christ forgives us. So like I said, David and Saul, they go their separate ways, but their paths are going to cross again for the final time next week.